This is probably going to be the longest video I've ever made, but I'm still experimenting with my style and what I'm going to be trying to make, so bear with me if some things are a little off or the editing is bad. I'm still learning a bit and just really wanting to see what I can do. I'm going to go through the tutorials while explaining everything that happens in them, that way even if you don't play the games you have an understanding as to what I'm talking about. This will significantly lengthen the video, but I think it's something I should do, that way the video can be watched on its own without no prior knowledge of the games, and this will uphold the integrity of the video for years, as it means it can stand on its own and not just be for people who are fans or who have played the games prior. The Fallout video game series was started by Interplay, who eventually sold the rights to Bethesda, who picked up the franchise to mixed reception. Mixed as in the older fans hated it and the new fans loved it. I oddly kind of fit into both of these groups, as I played the original games when I was so young that I really shouldn't have, and honestly I forgot about them until I replayed them many years later. Fallout 3 was handled by the new team at Bethesda Game Studios, and Fallout New Vegas was handled by Obsidian, a studio mostly comprised of developers from the original games. Fallout 4 was then again handled by Bethesda Game Studios. No game is made equal and the Fallout games are no exception to this. The reasons I like 3 have nothing to do with the reasons why I like 4 or New Vegas and I personally think that this is a good thing. It means we have multiple games within the same franchise that are varying in their storytelling and world building and allow you to have more adventures without feeling like you are retreading the same ground each game. The design choices of what the game's tutorials teach you do a great job of showing what the core focuses of the three Fallout games we will be discussing here are. Each game is made to be played in a different way and each of them does a fantastic job in teaching you the main ways in which they want you to experience the games within their tutorials, though some do do a better job than others in certain areas. What is a tutorial? This seems like an obvious question to some people, like, duh, a tutorial teaches you how to play the game. But the issue of answering this is more important than ever in modern day times, because this is definitely becoming less and less the case. A tutorial in the context of video games is described as, at least based on the Wikipedia article on tutorials for video games, a video game level that teaches the players the rules and control of the game. Some tutorials are integrated into the game itself, while others are completely separate and optional. Games can have both of these at once, offering a basic mandatory tutorial and optional advanced training. Tutorials can be important since they are the player's first impression of a game. Often, an overly tedious tutorial or one that does not allow for player freedom can negatively affect their view of the game. I think this is an important distinction to make while talking about the Fallout games and their tutorials. In modern video games, tutorials are no longer just small quick things or endless pop-ups on a screen, and the whole game can be a tutorial of sorts. While all of that makes sense, and this isn't a bad representation of how the Fallout games are handled, we're not necessarily going to be doing that. Modern Fallout games do have tutorials that are things you have no option but to do. However, the tutorials in many of them are actually expansive past that and optional, at least in the case of New Vegas and Fallout 4. What I'm going to pick are set yet arguable points for when the tutorials begin and end for these games. In the case of Fallout 3, it's easy, the vault is the tutorial. In the case of New Vegas, it's the town of Good Springs, learning from Sunny Smiles and the quest at the town, I don't think too many people have arguments against that other than it's optional, which we will cover when we get to it. Fallout 4 has a much, much weaker traditional tutorial into the wasteland, but I think a compromise to that is how much more linear the intro is and how much more people are willing to do the introductional optional tutorial parts. Even though it is optional, around 65% of players actually did that optional tutorial part which is more of people who even did the next part in the main story, so I'm gonna say it counts. Even more so when you consider the fact that 10% of players never even made it into the wasteland, but we can talk about that more when we get to Fallout 4 in depth. The reason I wanted to talk about all of this is that what the creators of the games chose to tutorialize to the player is showing what they believe the heart of the game to be. In the case of the Fallout games, it shows the differences in design that lead fairly similar games to feel and play so vastly different and I think that is incredibly interesting. We are also not going to talk about Fallout 76 either in this because its tutorial is actually 100% optional and extends far past the first few hours of the game, but if enough people demand it, I can do it in a separate video, but for now, I don't really think it's worth it. 
I do also want to have a quick word about the footage before we get into it. I know this has been a bit lengthy, but please bear with me. This is my first time making a huge video like this, and I ran into issues with every single one of the games while trying to record them. Fallout 3 was the issue of just getting it to work on Windows 10. New Vegas refused to launch even after I took all of the mods off, so I had to fight with it for a bit to get it to work, and though you will see it look a little different, the mods that stayed, despite me removing all of them, are just a texture and UI pack, so it's not going to affect the gameplay in any way, or affect anything I say in this video. Fallout 4 just had absurd problems. It was crashing more than any Bethesda game I've ever played, and I played 76 at launch. The footage came out a little bit choppy, and it was just awful all around trying to get it to work, even with fresh installing it multiple times. Though eventually I did, through the crashes, manage to get the footage, but if it looks a bit off, well, those are the reasons why. Without further ado, let's get into it. Let's start off with Fallout 3, as it was the first game developed by Bethesda. As I said in the history of Fallout, this was the fifth Fallout game to actually be released, however, it was Bethesda's first. They were adapting a few turn-based isometric RPGs, an isometric tactical game, and a fairly horrible isometric real-time RPG into a first-person exploration shooter action role-playing game. While it is heavily debated within the Fallout fandom what they actually did good or bad or how good of a game it is at all, that's not what we're here to talk about. Fallout 3 had a set focus it wanted to hone in on and a story it wanted to tell, and the style of gameplay that was not unlike their previous works. Within this, they went a different route with this game than any other Fallouts, and even a seriously different style than what we ended up seeing from the games that followed with their introductions. The game has a short and sweet introduction to set up where it's at. There was a nuclear apocalypse, but that was a good while ago. You live in a vault that was protected from the newts. It was here you were born. It is here you will die. Appropriately, the game then starts with that birth. You get a small cutscene of being born. During this, you pick your gender, you pick your name, and you customize a character based on a projection of how you, the baby, will look while grown up. It's quick and to the point, helps the character get a setup, and wastes no time. I think it's fantastic. During this, your mother passes away due to complications with your birth, and you skip forward a year. Okay, you want me. We need a doctor, not a dead You are now a one-year-old walking around the vault. This is the first time you actually get to control your character. You get a small tutorial on how to simply walk forward to your father, and then you get locked up and are actually not told what to do next. You are instantly given an option that says unlock your cage and go free. The game is both showing you hit this button to interact and saying, hey, you should go look around and explore a little. I could be looking too much into this, but I personally feel that this is a bit intentional. You're given a compass and objective marker to figure out for yourself, but they don't actually tutorialize that objective marker at all until a little bit later on. During this time, you are simply placed in a room and told to look around until you find a children's soft book that teaches you about your special stats. It gives you a rundown of what each of them do individually so you can assign points to them, and at the end gives you a full list so you can assign all of them at once to pick how you want your character build to be. After that, you get a small, basically, cutscene where your father talks to you a bit more, and then you skip forward nine more years. Experiment. Don't be a damn fool. We experiment to prepare. Welcome to your 10th birthday. Here you are given a pit boy and told to enjoy your birthday and talk to the people here. You will immediately be forced into a conversation after, and that'll give you a Grognak comic. Talking with other people in the area will give you a baseball cap, a poem, and a sweet roll. This is all to give you an opportunity to get used to using the pit boy to navigate menus and learn how it works. The pit boy works as your inventory, your quest manager, and everything else for this game. The comic teaches you how to check your consumables, as well as giving you a small skill boost to melee stats. The hat teaches you how clothing and armor works, and with the bonus of teaching you that clothes can give extra things like plus five speech and stuff of that nature. The poem you get slightly later on teaches you how to check your notes, which is where notes and other holotapes will be stored along your journey. All in all, this does an excellent job of giving you time to learn how to use the Pip-Boy and enough items to teach you how to navigate each point of it. The game has numerous pop-ups during this that go into greater detail on how everything works, and while I initially thought this was against them, 
they're really easy to quickly read through and get all the information out of, and work fairly well. Likely, due to Bethesda being not the greatest programmers, they likely didn't have all the tech to allow them to do smaller pop-ups, which they do by the time of Skyrim and Fallout 4, so I can forgive it for being ever so slightly annoying in this game. After this point, and after talking to at least most of the people you can, the That stupid robot destroyed the cake! And you are given the choice of how to handle Butch. Butch is a rude little bully of a kid, and for lack of a better term, he's an asshole. You're given a sweet roll from Old Lady Palmer, which I mentioned earlier, and you get to choose what to do with it and how to handle him demanding that sweet roll from you. You get a good many ways to deal with him from a conversation perspective. You can try to reason with him, but him being a little butt, it'll fail. You can just give him the sweet roll to defuse the situation. You could have also eaten it before talking to him, which prevents him from taking it from you at all. You can even spit on it so that he won't want it. All of these allow you to defuse this without him attacking you, but some options egg him on and cause him to actually want to physically attack you. I find this to be interesting greatly due to the fact that the game doesn't actually tutorialize fighting right now. Though a few options do cause him to attack and fight you, the only thing you can do if you do this is run over to the security guard and have him stop Butch from attacking you. Violence is not shown to be an option the game wants you to go with right out of the gate, and I think that says a lot about what they wanted from the game. Fallout 3 is teaching you how to handle conversations and that you can avoid conflict depending on how you manage those conversations. It's teaching you that you don't just have to fight your way through everything. Now whether or not this applies to the rest of the game is irrelevant for now and for this video, as I'm only really going over the tutorials here. But that is what the game is trying to teach during this moment. After this, you go downstairs and receive a BB gun after talking with Jonas, a nice scientist who works with your dad. As you are headed down to the depths of the vault, you get a pop-up telling you how the compass works in-game. The game then allows you to shoot at some targets and learn how the shooting works in a very safe and easy environment, as well as teaching you how VATS works and where it can be used. I like this, as the shooting in Fallout 3 is bad. No way around this, you will quickly realize it's not even able to really be considered passable like it can be in some games. It's straight up bad. This is a good thing. You're probably confused, so allow me to explain this a little bit. Fallout 3 is not meant to be just a shooter. It's meant to be an action RPG in the same vein as something like Oblivion or Mass Effect. The shooting is not meant to be the focus at all. Everything else is. The game being an action RPG means it doesn't need to have perfect combat, as the RPG side of things means you need to interact more with the systems built around that, more so than relying exclusively on the combat like you can in some of the later games. This is where VATS comes in. VATS is the Vault Tech Assisted Targeting System, and in game it allows you to pick a part of the enemy to hit with a percentage chance of your hit landing. In this tutorial for VATS, you just get to shoot a rad roach and see how it all works. It's simple, it works, and after that, you jump forward six more years. You're 16 now, which means you have to take the GOAT. An exam which tells you what job you're best suited to do in the vault. Everyone has to take it when they hit 16 and you're currently in your dad's doctor's office trying to get out of it. No dialogue here will change anything that happens, but it does give you an opportunity to bond a bit more with your father and make jokes and talk to him. This, on top of everything else that you've had happen so far, does a pretty decent job of making your dad a likable character that most players would feel slightly bonded to. Afterwards, you're free to go straight to the test yourself or look around. There's a few people to talk to who don't say much in the doctor's office, as well as a chance to pick up the first collectible item in the entire game the medicine bobblehead. This is a good introduction to the collectible bobbleheads as the game is displaying a bright blue and yellow item in a mostly gray space on your dad's desk, allowing it to pop more and be easily seen and found. When you pick it up, you get told about how they're rare collectibles and that you get a permanent boost to the medicine skill which, while skills have yet to be fully explained, this does give you some incentive to go out and find these bobbleheads. You are also given an opportunity to grab this again later on if you miss it now. After you leave this, you can head to the classroom to take the exam, but along the way you'll see Butch harassing Amada, both of whom you should remember from the birthday. The little gang they've talked about as kids have now grown up to be a proper gang as they're now teenagers and harassing Amada as you head into the exam. 
You get a ton of options on how to deal with this, like way more than most people realize. All options are given through dialogue and all of them you have to find for yourself, and I think this is wonderful. It teaches you, again, about looking for different alternative ways to solve problems through conversation. You can talk to his friends to get them to go against Butch. You can solve it through a speech check. You can flip sides and join them. You could choose to just straight up fight Butch. However, this option is liked behind a second choice confirming that you actually want to fight. Or you could even just ignore it completely and let them settle it on their own. This does an excellent job of giving you, the player, a ton of options of ways to handle everything that happens here. The speech check is tutorialized here by giving you a percentage option for the check to work, and in fact it can just flat out fail, but that's the dice roll you take with the option, which I think works fine, however it does get a little bit annoying later on. Given the option to join Butch shows the game's willingness to let the player choose what side they want to be on and allows you to do things that are just straight up mean or bad. If you talk to his friends, it shows that looking for different alternative ways around that person's circumstances can lead to you finding more options for completing a quest. Like talking to their friends, or in another circumstance just checking around the room, or something of that nature. And finally, the game shows that, yeah, you can in fact solve situations with violence. No matter what you do, you see the immediate repercussions of your actions firsthand here. Whether it's that Butch leaves Amada alone due to you threatening to tell the Overseer about him and his group, his group ends up having infighting and they all just leave on your own, you switch sides and join him, or you just beat them all down until they leave, you'll instantly see how that affected both their group and how they continue to treat Amada afterwards. Fallout 3 likes to do this a lot and prefers to operate in this way. If you do something, you'll most likely see the effects of what you did actually happen in the game while you are playing. A part of the game that is also tutorialized here is the karma system. This is a system where doing good deeds gets good karma, bad deeds gets bad karma. This is a system that gets a lot of flack for some of the things it does, such as putting definitive good or bad actions on how you handle quests later on. But for now, all it does is say that making the bully stop is good and helping them make fun of Amada is bad, which I think we can agree on. Now let's get on to the goat test. This is a test to help determine what your character's starting skills are and to give you a job in the vault. I literally always get Pip-Boy Technician. Though there are a large number of jobs, and the test answers actually do matter in determining what jobs and skills you end up with. Which I didn't honestly believe at first, because I literally always get Pip-Boy Technician. Well, well. Pip-Boy Programmer, eh? No matter what though, you can pick what you want later, and if you don't feel like taking the long test, you can always opt to skip out of it with the dialogue choice. This shows that there are optional things that you can do during quests, and though some of them are missable, they can be skipped if you don't want to do them. You fill out what you want from the skill list, and off you go to jump forward a few more years. Three years later, you are awoken from your bed by Amada and told that your dad escaped the vault, Jonas is dead, and they're coming for you. You can ask a few questions to get more information, but eventually you agree that you have to get out too. Amada tells you about a secret way to the door from under her dad's office and gives you the option to take her dad's gun that she stole to give to you. You can refuse the gun and leave it with her, but for now, let's assume that you actually do take it. She then runs off and gives you some time to get sorted. You can grab your old BB gun and baseball bat and some meds from the wall and head out to escape, as your big quest pop-up tells you to do. As you round the first corner, you will see a guard who yells at you to stop, only to be instantly attacked by rad roaches. You can choose to fight him or just run past him. Either way works. I've seen some people say that this allows you to have the option to run a pacifist run throughout the game and not fight anyone in the vault, but simply, you do not, and I'll get to that later, that's not something I want to focus on right now. Though I will say that I bet most players are going to kill him and take his armor since it's better than just having a basic vault suit for protection. From here, you get a little bit down the hall and Butch, the rude dude from before, stops to beg you for help. His mom is being attacked and he's scared she will die and he needs your help. He's giving you a small little subquest to go on right here and to help save his mom and you get a choice. You can help him, you can tell him straight up to fuck off, or, in an interesting twist, you can give him your BB gun and have him go take care of it himself. This isn't something the game really does later on, but it's interesting that it allows you to do it here. 
helping Butch is considered a good thing, where helping him is actually neutral. The game doesn't completely flag it with bad karma to not help him out, and I think that's a good thing. It shows that not helping someone isn't always a bad thing. You also instantly see what happens, as I said you do with most quests before. If you don't help him, his mother dies and he'll hate you. If you help him either way, his mother will be saved and he will praise you as a hero. It's the game again saying that you will see the consequences of what you do firsthand instead of just down the line, which I personally think is really good. From here, you can move forward and meet Officer Gomez. By this point, you should be realizing from all the roaches and corpses that the vault is in total chaos. When you meet Gomez, who protected you when you were a kid, he doesn't outright attack you and allows you to talk with him instead. No matter what you say, he will not initiate combat. You can also stop and help Andy the robot who ruined your cake, kill some roaches, and take one last stop by Dad's office to grab the bobblehead if you didn't already. From here, it's linear, with a few more guards giving you opportunities to fight people again and grab some more weapons or armor, or just sneak past until you reach Security Chief Hannon. Now, up until this point, you've pretty much been able to get through without actually killing another human. But you can't with him. He will attack you on sight, nothing will stop him, and you have to kill him. I've seen a few videos where people will say, oh, you don't have to, but as far as most new players are concerned, you have to. He will not be killed by roaches, he will come after you, and his walking path puts him directly where you have to go. While making this video, I played through this intro multiple times, and every time he showed up to fight me, no matter how hard I tried to sneak past him, which could be taken as the game saying sometimes you will have to fight, but for as far as I'm seeming to reach with a lot of these conclusions, I feel the game comes to about teaching you things, this isn't actually one of them. I firmly believe the game wanted you to be able to leave without killing a human, but Hannon made that not an option. Once he is dealt with, you come to a massive point full of options. As you arrive near the Overseer's room, you see the Overseer and a security guard questioning Amada. You have numerous options here, all of which are karma neutral. You can sneak in super stealthily, which I've never done successfully, but I know you can, and steal the key and password from the Overseer's pocket. You can go in guns blazing and kill the officer, then giving you the option to force the password from the Overseer or kill him and get it from his corpse. Or you can ignore it completely and find your own way. So let's say you choose to sneak in and steal, then you have to crouch, get in, and do the pickpocket tutorial. The way it works isn't really told to you, you just get to see his inventory and get to take it. In reality here you have a percentage chance to actually steal the item based on your sneak, the value, and weight of the item. However, I think for it to be tutorialized here, you're guaranteed to get the items no matter what, because even if he knows you're chasing him down, you can still steal him from his pocket. So honestly, you can sneak in and get a taste of the pickpocket life, but it's not a real tutorialization or even a good one, which I do think hurts the game a little bit. If you choose to go in guns blazing, you only have to kill Officer Mac, and then you get those few options. You can kill Amada's father, you can pickpocket him now, which is how I got the footage for this video, because like I said, I always get caught, or talk him into giving you the items, and while the game forces you to kill Mac, it still wants to show that you can also try to talk things out when the options are presented. Before we get to leave it all alone option, there's one more option I didn't talk about before. This is what happens when you leave the gun to Amada. If you remember, you get the option to take the gun or leave it with her, and we assumed for now that you took it, but what happens if you leave it to her? Well, this happens. She actually chooses to use it for herself. She will defend against the people coming after her when the time comes, and will actually stand up and do something about it. This is awesome, but I will say this is not something the game really teaches you about. This is more the game showing you that sometimes if you do something, whether it's refuse a gun, tell someone to do something, or not to do something, that you'll see what happens based on that. You will be there to witness the consequences of your actions. I think it's brilliant in that regard, even though in reality, it's not trying to actually teach you anything here. The game also has specific dialogue for if you choose to help her, or don't, or if you do kill her dad, or don't later on. And if you just choose to completely ignore her, you still get a set of unique dialogue. Moving past that, however, if you choose to ignore them completely, you get a few options. I keep mentioning the Overseer's key and password, the reason for this is his room is locked and so is his terminal to get out. You get two options here as well, you can just pick the lock and get a tutorial on lock picking, 
or you could do what the rest of the game has taught you and just explore around a little bit to find the key yourself, thus learning from what the game has taught you and exploring. Uh, same thing for the next room. You could hack the terminal yourself, or if you look to the locker directly beside it, you can find the password. From here, you open the way to the end of the vault and walk on down. After watching it open, you can speak with Amada one last time, get a unique dialogue here, depending on how her, Officer Mac, and her father were handled, and then you walk out before more security comes to fight you, eventually watching the door close behind you. You can see skeletons with signs littering the floor and instantly realize that people died out here not being able to come in after the bombs fell. You take a few steps forward and get a prompt to redo your character stats and redo your name and look. After that, you exit the cave of the vault and step out into the world of Fallout 3. Immediately after exiting, you get an immediate level up and you get to learn about how skill points work as well as pick what perks do which are all pretty self-explanatory, put points into guns to get better at guns, pick this perk to get the perk benefits. At this point, the tutorial is over and you are free to explore this new world. The game does an excellent job teaching you all of the core mechanics of the game within this vault, and there is nothing else that's outside from fast travel later on and radiation that the game teaches you as it fully prepares you for everything that goes down after you leave. This is honestly one of the best tutorials in gaming, even if it is a little bit wrong for an RPG to have this much of a linear lengthy tutorial, and it fully puts you in just the right mindset for what type of game this is. It's a good tutorial being a theme that most of the Fallout games share. I will talk a little bit later on on how it compares to the other Fallout tutorials, but for now, let's move on to my favorite video game ever made. Fallout New Vegas has a half good, half bad intro. If you're just coming into the franchise, it's kind of a super mixed bag. I say this because if you want a good setup for the world and want to learn what's going on, then it's perfect. It does a great job setting it up. However, at the same time, you don't really need any of it. You could totally just start the game knowing there was a nuclear apocalypse like 200 years ago, actually talk to the people about what's been going on, and hell, it would even make some of the scenes in the game better overall since you would be experiencing them in real time later on. However, that's not really that important. It sets up the world but isn't fully needed. However, the latter part of the intro is super important. You get a small cutscene of a dude in a checkered shirt shooting you in the head. It's a little brutal, but it does a great job of just setting up what is happening and what happened to you. You were shot in the head, you wake up in a doctor's office, and you go from there. This introduction is fast, and everything else is about to happen super fast as well. If you remember how long it took us to get through character creation in Fallout 3, just know we're about to do all of that in record speeds. The doctor asks for your name and you give it to him. He asks you to make sure he put everything back together right. And in this you customize your character, picking your gender and age within the game. As you stand up you walk over to the Vigor Tester Machine, which is where you go ahead and assign your special points the same way you did in 3 and then move to the couch afterwards. Doc Mitchell asks you a series of questions, how you feel about certain phrases, and then once you see him some Rorschach paintings. These all matter and actually do change what skills get tagged around the character, however in the long run after this conversation you pick the tagged skills yourself. From here he also asks for your medical history, Ain't like I expect to find you got a family history of getting shot in the head. And then you pick two traits. These are returning from the original Fallout games. But between the three Fallout games we're looking at here, this is the only game with them. You get to pick between options that give you something good and something bad at the same time, like the ability to throw faster but not as far for example. One of these is Wild Wasteland, which actually enables various easter eggs throughout the game. For one example, you can see the late Indiana Jones in a fridge near the starting town, or you don't. Simple as that. You pick a trait after seeing what the options are, then Doc Mitchell allows you to leave his house after giving you a Pip-Boy. You can mess around with it now if you want, but you don't actually have to, and it gives the same pop-ups as you saw in Fallout 3. You can spend some time looking around the houses if you want, which shows you a broken submachine gun, and a chemistry station you can work with if you have the points around currently, however, you likely won't have the points unless you specifically leveled into them when you start, so it's more something to come back to later on. Doc Mitchell tells you to head it over and see Sunny Smiles at the saloon, and from there you step outside and... That's it. You left his house. That was all very, very fast, so let's take a moment to look around at what the game just taught you. 
you learned how to get up, move, look around, interact with options, and you created your full character. If you bother to look around a little bit, you're also probably going to be leaving with a couple things of food, a knife, a laser pistol, and some extra ammunition and medical supplies. You get started super fast, so creating a new character for a playthrough is really, really quick, as after this, you're kicked out into the wide open wasteland. One could argue that this is the start of the game, as you can properly just wander off and do whatever you want. However, I would like to direct you at some dialogue with Sunny Smiles. This dialogue, after you agree to help her out, specifically has text that says, End Tutorial. Therefore, technically doing stuff with her is part of the tutorial still. Therefore, for the sake of this, we're going to include, well, all of the events that transpire with her and more, which I will explain later on. But for now, her stuff is specifically marked tutorial, so we're going to be doing the quest with Sunny Smiles at the start of the game. For now, we walk on outside and head over to visit Sunny Smiles. Along the way, you can meet with Victor and Easy Pete and talk to them. Victor is the robot that digs you out of your grave, and Easy Pete is just an old man who lives there. Victor can give you a lot of information about digging you up and the people who shot at you, but Easy Pete can give you information about the world. Here's where I think it comes into play that Fallout New Vegas' intro gives you too much information. You can easily ask Easy Pete about the NCR, the Legion, and everything else happening around New Vegas, and he will not only tell you about them, but give his own insight onto what he thinks about the events happening. One of the few things I'll praise Skyrim for is when I went back to replay it recently on my Switch and PS4, I talked to every NPC about who they would want in charge of things, and most would actually have opinions on what's happening in the Civil War in Skyrim. This is much the same, and most people in this world will have opinions on what's going on here in Fallout New Vegas as well. This is the reason I said the intro is kind of weak as well. It tells you a lot about what's happening within the game world, where I think it would be better for you to just play the game without it, and learn about the factions vying for power and everything else going on from the people within the world as you just talk to them. Easy Pete also tells you about some items that are locked up in an old schoolhouse, and afterwards you head inside to talk to Sunny Smiles. You can ask her about a larger number of things than Pete, like a route to Prim if there's any extra work around the town and more, and if you ask for work she will direct you to the aforementioned schoolhouse, some lockpicks and a locksmith reader book to try and help you to get into the safe that she and Easy Pete said was inside. After that you can ask for help with survival training, and you and her will walk out back. She'll give you a rifle and some rounds, she'll set up some bottles and teach you about basic shooting and gunplay, with small corner pop-ups included. And how much it is improved from Fallout 3 is instantly apparent. It's not a huge leap, but you can now aim down sights and crouching steadies your aim and makes you more accurate. This makes gunfights feel immensely better, however it doesn't make the game feel like a proper shooter in the way that Fallout 4 does. While it would be nice for it to at least be a little bit better, I am in the camp that the little jank it has is still needed and without it the game would be worse as a whole, as I said with 3, so I really like this upgrade even if it's only a slight one. From there you get asked to help her clear out the geckos around the water lines just outside of town. When you get over there she tells you to stay low and sneak up on them which prompts a little pop up in the corner to teach you how to sneak. As you approach the geckos, you get a reminder to hit the VATS button, which functions the exact same way as Fallout 3 with the exact same pop-up. After killing that set of geckos, Sunny asks if you would like to help clear out some more geckos, and as part of the tutorial, you accept. You clear out one batch of them, and on the way to your next, you hear someone screaming, Help! And you can go help them. After you kill the geckos attacking the woman, you can speak to her or she will come to you. Since you saved her, you earn reputation with Good Springs and get a pop-up telling you about the game's reputation system. This is one of the better systems in the game that New Vegas has. There are many communities and groups in the world of New Vegas, so the system is fantastic in helping you track how everyone feels about you, as well as actually having a neutral middle ground so you don't just get to be a nobody if you straddle the line of good and bad within those groups. It'll just make you seem untrustworthy. This system seems like it has a lot to be explained, but the game does a fantastic job of explaining it during the first real quest that we will get to later on, but for now I'll just say it's good and the pop-up simplifies it a lot. I also want to mention something that New Vegas also does really well here. The woman you save can die, as can Sunny's dog Cheyenne. If the woman dies, easier said than done,
then you don't get a pop-up about the reputation right now, and instead you learn about it a little bit later, as well as get a unique dialogue option for Sunny, where she talks about her dog dying. After either of these, however, if you talk to Sunny, she will want to teach you about living off the land, which is a game teaching you about the new crafting system. Fallout 3 had a crafting system, but it was very rarely used, but in New Vegas you can craft bullets, you can work on weapons to add things like scopes or larger magazines, or create or cook food and make drugs. She tells you to find some Xander root and a Brock flower. The Xander root is over by the school and is closer, so you'll probably head there first, at least I did for this video. While there, I remembered the game subtly pushing me to check out the safe that's inside the schoolhouse by two separate characters trying to push you towards that, so I chose to check that out. But that's optional, I hear you say. Honestly, you're right, but with two separate characters telling you to go check it out, you'll probably go check it out. We will come back to this a little bit later though, because this is a conversation I want to have for optional content within this video. For now, just accept that you check out the schoolhouse, and inside you find a locked safe and a locked terminal. If you talk to Sunny before you went in, then you have lock picks to lock the safe and a magazine to help get your lock picking skill up if it's not high enough. And if you didn't, there's a programmer's digest right there on the table so you get an extra 10 skill in science to hack the terminal, so likely you should be able to get into one of them. With my character build, I could get into both fairly easily. Using either the terminal or the safes gets you the pop-ups on tutorials using lock picking or hacking, which is exactly the same as it was in Fallout 3 in that it's simple, works, and doesn't really need to change. After this, you head over to the cemetery on top of the hill where you were shot to grab the Brock flower. As you get up there, you may look around a little bit after killing some bugs. You can find multiple graves which tell you you need a shovel to open them, and then you can also find a snow globe. The snow globes are the new collectibles for this game. They work like bobbleheads, except they don't give you the bonus stat, but some collectors will pay dearly for them, so they have some monetary value. You grab the block flower and head back to Sunny, where she tells you to make some healing powder, which you do at the campfire. At this point, she tells you to stop back at the saloon to talk with Trudy, the town mom, and the tutorial with her is done. At this point, we have basically learned all the game mechanics such as crafting, scavenging, looting, and shooting. Basically everything you need to survive in all the mechanics of the game. The tutorial alongside Sunny is done, and you could well argue that this is the end of the Fallout New Vegas tutorial. However, I would argue this is not quite the end and that there's a little bit more to it than that. Fallout 3's tutorial ends when you exit the vault and get to reset your points and character. Fallout New Vegas only does this when you leave the town of Good Springs. One can make a decent argument that everything you do in the town is tutorial, and honestly, I'm okay with making that argument. The game teaches you a lot of specifically mechanics during that quest of Sunny, but it has so much more in terms of what makes New Vegas great, and all of that it teaches you within the main quest lines of the town of Good Springs. So, we're going to move on from here and talk about the rest of it. When you head back out to actually meet Trudy, you'll find her in an argument with a man named Joe Cobb. Joe Cobb wants to find a trader who didn't pay his fine for crossing through Cobb's territory, which is run by a gang he's a part of, the Powder Gangers. Trudy says you should talk to a trader named Ringo who's held up in the old gas station, but you get a few options here. I'm not going to say what they are. I'm just going to say you get a lot of options here, and remember that because we will come back to it in a few. For now, we're going to do what most players will do. So you go to talk to Ringo at the gas station, and he tells you about the game called Caravan, and how he can pay you back later for helping him out now, and likely you can probably get Sunny to help him fight back against the gang as well. You get a Caravan starter deck, and Caravan itself is a super not complicated game, but it's actually really easy to understand and really kind of broken. But it works as a fun mini game for the whole game where you can collect cards and make decks to battle opponents. If you ever played Witcher 3 and Gwent, think about it like that. Him asking you to help kicks off the quest Ghost Town Gunfight. Once you talk to Sunny, she instantly agrees to help you and tells you you could probably get other people around the town who are willing to help out as well. This is a game teaching you about the optional objectives. You could go square up with Joe Cobb right now this instant, but the game doesn't really want you to do that. It wants you to prepare a bit first, but only if you want to. Closest is Trudy, who's still in the bar here with Sunny, so you go to talk to her. You can convince her with either a skill check of speech or sneak, 
and this is introducing one of the greatest role-playing aspects to you. What you build your character into matters, but they will allow you to build into whatever you want and the game will plan around that. You get a joke option that auto fails if the skills are not high enough, but you can always see how far away your points are from one of the other options. Anyways, Trudy has a speech and a sneak check, both of which will cause her and more of the town to help. Easy Pete has an explosives check to get some extra dynamite, and barter skill will help you get the town better equipped for the fight if you talk to the shopkeep, and during this quest, Doc Mitchell will willingly give you some extra meds for free. After doing all or none of or some of this, you can do the fight. You get a big standoff with you helping the town fight back against a gang of invading powder gangers. Once all the powder gangers are dead, the quest is complete. You get a reward from Ringo and the promise of more rewards should you meet him again down the line. And as I said before, you have some options earlier. I'd like to explore a lot of those options now. This is not something that most players will know, but around this whole town you can find skill magazines for free that will help you complete every single one of the skill checks around the town. Much like how you can find the one for hacking right next to the terminal to teach you how to hack. You can also kill Joe Cobb, who's just a little ways down the road and makes the fight easy for you. Also, reputation-wise, you can take a big hit for actually killing the Powder Gangers, which is an issue since they obviously would have more power around the area than a single small off-the-beaten-path town would. But outside of even those options, you can go as far as helping Joe Cobb instead. So let's assume you may take that option. Then you get a whole new set of skill checks and a whole new quest called Run Good Springs Run. With this quest, you instantly go kill Ringo and then help Joe Cobb take over the town. This has you fighting against a fully prepared Good Springs, giving you a ton of loot and items as well as getting you on the good side of the Powder Gangers early on. You can even just kill everyone or nobody during this. Every single NPC in the entire game is killable, and you can complete the whole game without ever killing anything or by killing everyone. Even sitting back during this fight, if you decide to side with Good Springs, actually helps you more than it hurts you. This is a lot, but it goes to show the level of depth to quest design that you can expect from New Vegas, and that is truly what makes it stand out. This is what makes New Vegas as great as it is, really. The quest design is on a level that is just above most other games and is the main point of the game. You see it just in this fight. What you do matters. If you participate or don't, then things don't happen, but it means that something as simple as who controls the town is entirely up to you. The game does an excellent time teaching you that with the first real quest before you get to choose to take off into the wasteland. As you do wander off into the wasteland, you get a final chance to redo your skills, traits, and your character visually one last time. And with that, Fallout New Vegas' tutorial is over. The game has done an excellent job teaching you every main mechanic you need to survive out in the wasteland and complete the game, as well as help to show you what really makes it stand out. This tutorial is now over though, so let's move on to Fallout 4. Fallout 4's introduction is... interesting. Fallout 4 doesn't tell you about the state of the post-war world or teach you what happened to it, which is a massive difference from 3 and New Vegas. It instead chooses to show you what pre-war was like. You learn through its introduction that up to World War II, things were mostly the same. Yet after that, there was a split in history, and in the world of Fallout, they began to use nuclear energy to power things in ways that we currently cannot. Think Jetson's future, but resource wars and a nuclear apocalypse, which is oddly fitting, but not the point. At the end of this, it transitions into the classical war, war never changes, as all Fallout games do. However, this time... It puts you into seeing the words repeated in the mirror by a male protagonist. Though it's not really important to this analysis, I do feel it was a misstep to have made the players into characters to inhabit over instead of making them be blank states, as this somewhat alienates anyone wanting to play as a woman in the game. Like, do you play as the military veteran who has seen combat and been in a war already? Or do you play as the woman with a law degree who recently gave birth? I'm just saying it wasn't really the best choice to go with, and I think they could have planned this better, yet that's not the point of this video. I personally think the female voice actor is leagues better than the male, so we're gonna make the husband as fat as possible and just go with her. That's perfect. 
As I said before, the intro to Fallout 4 is hugely different. As you can easily tell, this is all pre-war. Tutorial-wise here, you would think there's not much, but really the game gives you a safe, open environment to explore, get used to the movement and look controls, and hitting the use button, which we're obviously going to do a lot. Eventually, a vault tech rep shows up to the door to tell you that you both have a place in the nearby vault with your family and to give you a tutorial in the new dialogue. You may be wondering how we've evolved dialogue from 3 in New Vegas to 4, and we have evolved into now having just four options. That's right, four perfect options. This game did not take a step after New Vegas dialogue, and instead kind of did its own thing, and its change is way more impactful than you may think. We can get into it a bit more in depth later on, but for now, I'll just say it's bad due to the lack of choices you get. For now, you can either be nice to the dude or not, it really doesn't matter what you do as it all goes the same way and you end up filling up the character sheet no matter what. Here you pick your name and allocate your special, something you should be used to by now. Unlike the other games, it's not really hidden behind anything, it's just a straight up pop-up menu that shows up for you. After that, you spend a little more time walking around the house and have another small dialogue interaction with your spouse where again, the options don't matter, but it kind of makes sense for this conversation. It's just a little one-off, but it does help to highlight one of the options. Instead of doing things in other games like telling you what you were about to say, you just get the sarcasm, yes or no style options. This is mostly fine, but it has issues that arise with these options of you not knowing what you want to say, and it has other issues that Ken I'll talk about a bit later on. At this point, your robot Codsworth comes to tell you that shit is popping off. By popping off, I mean knock knock, the nuclear hellfire of the end of the world is here. Like now. So your spouse grabs your baby and you both head off for the vault, and you get a slight introduction to how the game will handle some instances where your character would talk without you choosing an option here with this guard. Which is something that does end up happening a lot more later on in the game and is quite annoying. You run up with a guard onto the vault door platform and boom. This moment speaks for itself. Afterwards, you end up down in the vault itself and are given a vault suit. You walk with a scientist down the length of the vault and then hop into a small pod to get rid of your radiation after putting on your vault suit. You watch your spouse jump into the pod across from you with your child and then the pod freezes you. The player can kind of tell what's happening and it makes sense because you got to end up in the wastelands somehow and after a few seconds you defreeze but your player character has no idea what's happened. You watch a small cutscene of getting unfrozen and watch someone open up the other pod across from you and attempt to take your baby. After a slight struggle with your spouse, they get shot and killed, and then they take the baby, call you the backup, and leave. At this point, you get refrozen and thawed for a second time with no idea how much time has passed. I want to mention that you never get to tell anyone in the game that you were refrozen after your baby was taken, but I digress. You fall out of the pod and you deal with another game crash. I mean, you check on your spouse to see that they are in fact dead. Your character claims they will get revenge and get their baby back. At this point, you've regained full control and get to explore the vault as you please, taking your time to check out everything. It's a pretty good segment where you can read some of the information about what happened on terminals around the place and really just take your time. Time is obviously passed, but it's not clear how much yet, and it's a good section overall. You find that everyone in every other pod is also dead, and that you are the sole survivor, which becomes your tagline for the rest of the game. As you explore, you can now pull up your fist and throw hands with all the nothing around you. Eventually, you follow the only path you can and see a rad roach through the window, and are given two opportunities to pick up nightsticks, and after the second time, the game throws some rad roaches at you to kill. They're easy one-hit kills, and during this time, you get a few pop-ups on how to pull out your weapon as well as how to block. I like this. It's giving you the weapons and letting you kind of figure it out. It doesn't pause the game like the other Fallout tutorials do. It just pops up in the corner and gives you some information, which is much better and more intuitive. After this, you begin to find skeletons of vault dwellers and scientists. You enter the next room to grab a stim pack and a pistol. At this point, you can look around a little bit more and find some extra ammo and see a weapon on the wall that you can't get to now, but you could get later on. This does a really good job of teaching you a few things. One, exploration is a useful thing, which can be seen as obvious, but as we talked about with Fallout 3, it isn't always, so it's good the game teaches you that. 
and that you can come back to places with higher levels and more experience to get better rewards later on, which both is and isn't true for the rest of the game as I can't think of too many experiences where that is actually true. But I do know if you want the best power armor in the game, that is true. From there, you try to move forward, but are told to use the terminal. This lightly teaches you that some doors will need an alternative way to open, be it a button or terminal, which is something the game does use more often that you will see later on. From there, you enter a hallway with a ton of rad roaches. The game tells you how to aim down sights, and it tells you the button for vats, allowing you to test out the pistol on a handful of enemies and get a feel for vats, which has its own tutorials in the corner. The game also informs you that even while holding a weapon, you now have a gun bash, a wonderful addition to make the game feel more modern. This whole section is one super well-crafted combat encounter for teaching the player about how things work. Rad Roaches barely do any damage, and the game gives you a few stim packs to help get you through. It also automatically equips all of your weapons and stim packs to the hotkeys, allowing you to actually move through them and use them against pretty basic enemies in a safe environment. This is excellent in getting you used to the combat in a quick and decently fun way. The gunplay is also vastly improved and feels like a proper actual shooter now. It's not even just serviceable, it's honestly good. Also, VATS works the same way as before, except instead of it fully freezing time to aim, it just slows it down a lot, but otherwise it's the same. After this point, you find a pit boy that will act as your journal and inventory for the game and get a small tutorial for it and some time to play around with it and get used to it. Which is, again, nice and a lot better than how New Vegas handle it by far. It puts you straight into the menus for it and lets you look around and mess with it. After this, you open the vault for yourself and watch in amazement as the vault door opens from the inside, giving the same feeling it did in Fallout 3 when you do it for the first time. Yet, slightly to a lesser degree since you spend way less time inside. Then you prepare to leave, watch the elevator descend and get on it. You're prompted then to redo your character and change up your face name and special. As you know from 3 and New Vegas, this basically marks the end of tutorial and you may be questioning, well, that can't be right, can it? What, what about everything else? And for those of you playing Fallout 4, you're likely going, that's not enough, or that's not what the game is even about. And you're right because Fallout 4 changed focus in a lot of drastic areas compared to the other games. It is about exploration, but not just for the sake of exploration. Suddenly upgrades to weapons and armor, or to make new houses, or build for your communities, you need to scavenge loot. Stuff that had no purpose like a pencil in Fallout 3 is now a source of wooden lead in Fallout 4, and drastically changes the way you look at every little thing in the game. A large portion of the perks in the game are based around this, Around 15 or so of them are even just about the settlement and crafting the game has, which is all the useless stuff from the old games is now based around. The core of Fallout 4 is the phase of exploring, shooting, and crafting. If you want a video about someone going way more in depth about this, watch the first 25 minutes or so of Joseph Anderson's Fallout 4 but one year later video. But to sum up what I'm trying to say, the game does have more than those phases, but those are the wheels on the bus that makes the rest of it go round and round. No matter what you do in Fallout 4, you have to go somewhere, shoot something, and gather items for the crafting system. The game is arguably 90% open world shooter and 10% or less role playing game. There are more systems built into this, like quests and companions, but the core of it is still far less of an RPG than any of the other games in the franchise. That may come off a bit harsh, but seriously, do not take it that way. That is actually the appeal of Fallout 4 and easily the game's greatest strength. It works so well as just a shooter, you may not even notice these phases in action at all, or even notice the lack of RPG elements until replaying it and looking back at it. Even when this game came out, I put 24 hours into it, within it being out for 24 hours. I legitimately played it for an entire day when it released, and I didn't even realize the game was like this until my fourth time replaying it. This makes the game easier to replay and is good for what kind of game it is. However, to go any further to talk about that would bring us way more off topic than we already are. I wanted to tell you all of this to explain why I believe the tutorial expands far past what you've seen so far with Fallout 4. 
You could absolutely make the argument that no, this is the cutoff for the tutorial of the game because realistically, you could play 100% of the game to completion by just learning how to shoot and do the basic conversation tutorial the game's had so far. And before even writing this script for this video, I talked with multiple people about where the tutorial for Fallout 4 really actually stops. Most of them agreed after talking that it needed to be extended a far bit, but one of them claimed to have never crafted it all and that he hated the system in the game, yet even he still agreed the tutorial realistically needs to extend outside of the vault a little bit. The reason for this is that the core of Fallout 4 is not only the system that I explained earlier. For the record, 10% of the players never even made it into the wasteland. On Xbox and PlayStation, more than 65% of players who actually played the game bothered to continue and do this optional side quest that teaches you far more about the game than the vault does. It's worth mentioning that less than 70% of players even made it to level 5, and less than 60% even actually went to the next quest in the game. But more people than even continued the story bothered to do this quest. On top of the argument that more players actually did these quest lines and did the tutorial stuff for that, and the achievements for that, most of the DLC is actually related to doing stuff with workshops more than it is anything else in the game. Out of these six released DLC, four of them exclusively revolve around the workshops. So while it may not strictly be content that you were forced to do, it is content that actually does explore way, way more of the game's core concepts and is a much larger, I would argue, better tutorial overall for what the game is actually trying to be. So with all that said, and for the sake of this video and to give Fallout 4 a fair chance to actually teach us what the core mechanics outside of just shooting in conversations, and it didn't even finish the conversations tutorial, I should add, we're going to continue onwards. So you leave the vault and honestly get an amazing scene. You see your old neighborhood, the one you were in maybe 20 minutes ago, in absolute ruins. It's wonderful, and it really helps to show how much time has passed and introduce you to the, well, wasteland that you will be playing within. I feel at this point most players will probably follow the path back down the hill, possibly looting the boxes around as they do so, and if you do that, you find a few healing items and likely a molotov that I'm pretty sure is a guaranteed spawn that will auto-equip and give you a small pop-out teaching you that if you want to use grenades, you just hold down the melee button. Which, as I said, the melee button before being a wonderful addition that I completely forgot to grab footage of me using, so here it is in Fallout 76 instead. Anyways, as you head back down towards the old neighborhood and you crash again, I mean you walk up and see your old robot Codsworth still living at your house. The game directs you to talk to him and initiates a conversation where he tells you that 200 years have passed. You can tell something is up with him, and this is the game introducing you to skill checks. And by skill checks, I mean charisma check. You have at the worst a red charisma check where you only have a 35% chance to actually complete it, and that goes up by 15% each charisma point. At 10 charisma, you just complete every single charisma check, and drugs and clothes do help with that stat, making it kind of really easy to complete every single one of the checks. I say all of that to somewhat further push forward the point that conversations are not really the focus in the game, though they are there. You are guaranteed to complete this charisma check, as it is the tutorial charisma check. Afterwards, you and Codsworth go around to check out the neighborhood. This is not something you can say no to. Telling him no just prompts you to explore the neighborhood with him anyways and waits for you to initiate the conversation again and say yes, or to even say maybe, which is also yes. So, you and Codsworth do light searching around the nearby houses and find nothing. Codsworth mentions that some humans are down the road in the town of Concord, prompting you to go and check that out. Most players are likely just going to follow the road out of Sanctuary down to the Red Rockard in Concord, and we are assuming right now that you don't really stop to learn how to upgrade weapons or start doing some house building at this point, and we'll kind of get to why a little bit later, though I will say there's a real chance you do actually stop and do some light armor and gun customization at this point. Though on the way out, you do see a cooking station right outside one of the houses, which is incredibly difficult to ignore, where you can stop and cook all that radroach meat you got earlier from within the vault and with Codsworth. 
After this, you keep going down the road and end up passing by a Red Rocket gas station that has a dog at it. He runs up to you and you get a few dialogue prompts, all of which end with the dog following you as your first companion. This is a nice little introduction to companions and allows you to have a good neutral character that's hard to dislike unless you just hate dogs. It also shows how companions have a new ability where you can tell them to grab things or do stuff like open certain doors. Each companion has their own ability and the dog can be sent off to grab ammo and random items, like telling them, hey, find me a weapon or hey, find me some ammo. You can even find things during the story as well. Other companions can lockpick more difficult doors or do hacking for the player, which is cool, but the game doesn't outright tell you that now. For now, you just get the dog and he's cute and you move on. As you head down to Concord with your new dog buddy, you hear gunshots towards the center of town. When you run down there, you see some raiders fighting with a random dude in a building. Unlike Fallout New Vegas, where you can choose to help the raider assholes, you just have the ability to help out the group hold up in the building, which again, for this kind of game, is totally fine. At this point, you grab the laser musket the dude from the building told you to grab and head on inside to help him out. You make your way through the building, fighting the raiders inside, and get up to the room that he's held in. His name is Preston Garvey. He explains that he used to be part of a group called the Minutemen that got broken up, and everyone in the room is what's left of them. He and Sturgis, another guy within the group, also tell you that he has a plan to get out of the building using some old power armor from a crashed vertebrate on the roof. But it needs a functional fusion core to get it working, a new introduction to how power armor is handled in Fallout 4. You could have grabbed one beforehand, or one from within the building, if not, Preston tells you to go grab it from down to the bottom of the building. You can tell Preston no during this interaction, and that you won't help him, and it literally doesn't matter if you say this. The objectives you get afterwards are exactly the same, and at this point I want to go back and talk about what I was saying before about the dialogue. This game does not evolve dialogue from 3 or New Vegas into 4. Instead, it's made to be far, far more linear. While this does sound really bad, it's honestly not. The focus was simply on other things, like that core gameplay loop. While they could have done more to make it better, they were obviously focused on other things and wanted a set story to be told. You can also find the first bobblehead and magazine in the room with the Minutemen, showing you the two main collectibles that work more as perks for this game, and this is kind of a good change overall. Bobbleheads work exactly the same way as Fallout 3, and they making the magazines work as perks means that it's way cooler to find one and way better overall to bother to find all of them. As you go down to grab the power armor core, you have a few options of how to get to it. You can either do the hacking or lockpick your way into it, both of which are exactly the same from Fallout 3 and New Vegas, which is fine because I still feel those are done well and didn't need to change. After grabbing the fusion core, you head up onto the roof and look at how power armor works in the new game, and honestly, it's pretty awesome. It's kind of like an Iron Man suit. Power Armor in Fallout 4 completely changes up how the game plays. You need plenty of fusion cores just to sit in the armor, and you have to repair it when it breaks down, which I do want to add is something you don't actually have to do for weapons and armor in this game. So it means you can't just sit in the power armor all the time, which is a good change. The payoff for keeping it together is that you are basically a walking tank. In a scene that feels like superhero fulfillment, you grab a minigun off this crash vertebrae and tear through all the enemies around you as well as fight a Deathclaw while in the power armor very early in the game. There's a very, very good chance some of the armor will get ruined in this fight and need to be repaired, but you can likely finish this fight with absolutely no problem. After this, you will talk to Preston back inside the building, and he will tell you that the Minutemen are going to head up to Sanctuary. The quest won't finish until you actually talk to him at Sanctuary again, so after you wait for him to go up there and show up, or walk up there with him, you can then talk to him and he'll ask you to help Sturgis in rebuilding Sanctuary. This leads to the quest Sanctuary, and this is the quest that tutorializes all of the building and settlement and crafting mechanics. Sturgis will always be around the center building, which is multiple workbenches nearby, one for power armor, one for regular armor, and one for weapons. In the game's effort to make sure you do at least some armor and weapon crafting, when you pass by the red rocket station as well, it has all these exact same workbenches, so you will probably drop off your power armor at one or the other of these, and at least mess around with the system a small amount. You can also then take some time to check out the upgrade system for weapons and armor, which is basically just take these different random items you have, combine them together to make a new scope for the pistol, or turn the pistol automatic, or something like that. 
This allows for far greater customization in adding parts and bonuses to a gun to change it into what you want. It's a great system, and it takes advantage of the fact that suddenly everything has worth. A desk fan now has some metal and some screws instead of purely being junk like they were in the previous games, and as I said before, this is an incredibly well done change. The reason I waited to talk about the settlements here is that this quest does a great job in teaching you how all the mechanics of it work in a way that you may not be able to figure out if you just choose to do it on your own. Since you helped out the minimum before, there are actually people living in the town, so you have to provide the basic things they need to live. That means the game can naturally teach you about things like setting up beds, making sure there's food and people are assigned to it, making sure there's clean water flowing through the area, setting up electricity and defenses, and you do all of this in a normal and not intrusive pure pop-up way, though you can learn about it through those little pop-ups on the side otherwise. With this, you're just completing a quest. In the case of this quest, you just ask Sergis what you need to build, build it, and then go talk to him again. At the end of this, Preston sends you on the first Radiant quest of the game, which more people also completed than they did the first main quest of the game, I want to add. And now, you truly have learned everything that you need to get the most out of the game. While it can easily be argued you didn't have to do any of that, the team at Bethesda did an insane job changing up the core features and making huge additions to the game to expand it in ways that are purely focused around that crafting mechanic. From changing the value of every single random item in existence in the game world, to making huge additional yet optional sim style settlements and making more than 20% of the perks in the game be based around just those systems, shows that they obviously wanted those to be a massive focus of the game. If you just learned how to shoot and talk, then you would get a far lesser experience and not really the one the game wanted you to have. And you would miss out on what most of the game is based around. I think this is why the tutorial needed to be expanded far past what it taught you in just the vault, because without the expansion outside of it, the core loop of the game just isn't there. Nothing in the vault really represents or prepares you for what you will likely spend the majority of the time doing in the game. To take this a step 30 with achievement percentages, 10% of people never even entered the wasteland, around 30% of players actually beat the game, and over double this, crafted 100 settlement items, allied with 3 different settlements, collected over 1000 scrap items for settlements. Even the DLC of the game had a clear focus on this, as out of the 6 DLC released for the game, 4 of them were exclusively about the workshops and building aspects of the game. The focus is clear in the game on what they wanted to teach you by taking you on a somewhat linear path as you leave the vault, and I think that works heavily in the game's favor. So as far as a comparison of everything we've learned here, you can likely see that each of the games teach you different things overall, however, all will teach you the basic mechanics. All three games teach you at the least how conversations, shooting, looting, lockpicking, and hacking work within their main tutorials. With the main tutorial parts of all three games, you get an excellent understanding of how the games operate and all the mechanics you need to actually get through the game. Fallout 3 does an excellent job of teaching you that, hey, you should explore, and you should look around, and you should take time with quests to look for extra options and stuff like that. You'll see how things work out if you bother to do that. Exploration is the king of Fallout 3, and the game does an insanely good job at showing this in the small, locked-in tutorial. Fallout New Vegas teaches you that builds do matter and the game is willing to account for how you play it and your playstyle within it, and that there are always more options for completing quests than what you will likely even find. Finding key items, talking to people, and performing speech checks really allow you to roleplay in a game well above what almost all other video games are actually willing to do, and really allows you to get the most out of your time with it. Fallout 4 teaches you everything you need to beat it, and the optional parts go well out of their way to make sure you experience the most content possible from the game, and understand what a lot of the more core features of the game are and what it has to offer, so that you can get the most out of your time with it. I did go a bit far with Fallout 4 and Fallout New Vegas, and as to what can be taught from them, as a large portion of their parts were only bits of the game that were totally optional. However, I feel these parts lay the foundation for what the games are really aiming to teach you outside of the baseline mechanics of them. The games themselves are excellent in differentiating themselves between 3 having a 
fun story that starts at your birth, New Vegas having a story of someone relearning something that they have forgotten, which also makes it expertly well done as the player would have no information going in as well, and four, teaching you about how to talk and shoot, the core of that game. The designers of Fallout 3, New Vegas, and 4 knew what their games were about. Within this, they knew exactly what to teach and how it would impact what you learn and do in the game. They all did an excellent job of knowing what the cores of these games are and what makes them special, and while they all taught the same core mechanics, they did an even better job in each respective game showing you how all the extra parts of the game really set them apart and make each Fallout game special. This took me so much longer to make than I thought it would. I <laughs> I originally wrote an ending to this that was supposed to be uh, what I would put in at the end, of course, uh, what you're hearing now. And I threw it all away because so much time passed between originally writing that and actually finishing my script and the current time we're at now. <laughs> I started making this video four months ago because I had no idea what I was doing and I just recorded all of the Fallout 4 portion and then wrote the script part for that and that's how I would do it in order. Record Fallout 4, write script, record 3, write script, re record New Vegas, write script. And during that time, after recording the New Vegas portion, I ended up buying a house and moving completely. So. That put a damper on doing things, and then my video editor, I had been using all this time to edit it, an old version of Sony Vegas I used, uh, completely shit the bed on me and began crashing all the time, and I was completely unable to use that to edit anything at all. So, I then moved to using a Magix video editor for the last about month, and I managed to edit the Fallout 3, 4, New Vegas portions of it entirely with that. And during that time, I began to have weird internet issues, which I learned only a few days ago were caused by that editor somehow. Every time I opened it, it would make my internet and Wi-Fi just kill itself and be unusable. So that's fun. So this video was entirely comprised of three separate video editors as I finished it up on Adobe Premiere Elements 2020 that I purchased the same day I'm recording this audio. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm doing. This is the first time I've ever made something this big. I hope you enjoyed it. I really do. Uh, also, during the time from starting recording this, I started streaming on Twitch. I actually made it to affiliate on there, and I stream at least once every week. I try to, and I've been having a lot of fun on there. So I'll put a link to that in the description. Come hang out with me there if you enjoy the video, and I hope this is at least of good quality since it took so long, and I'm sorry it took so long. My next video is not going to be anywhere near as big. It'll probably be less than 20 minutes because I know this one's a lengthy boy. And again, I had no idea what I was doing. So just thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed.